Welcome to the show, which for many marks the end of one week and the beginning of a migraine. In the wake of the Eastbourne by-election, the Conservative Party discovers the addresses of all those supporters who switched their votes to the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> As the Labour Party gather to discuss their bad showing, Neil Kinnock's image makers persuade him to try out a new look. <laughs> As usual, two teams of wacky funsters have agreed to be publicly humiliated in a desperate attempt to prove they know what's going on in the world. Now, sitting on my right hand, a curious little idiosyncrasy of his, is team captain Ian Hislop. And on Ian's team this week, writer, performer, singer, pianist, satirist, songwriter and comic, the rather limited Dilly Keane. <laughs> and on my left, the cheerful, happy-go-lucky expression of Paul Merton. <laughs> and with Paul, a man who over the years has worked for The Observer, The Guardian, The Washington Post and even the BBC, he'll sink to any depth, Simon Hoggart. <laughs> Two points if you're right and no points if you're wrong is, as ever, the rather complex scoring system we have and one point if you're deemed to be somewhere in between. So let's leap legs akimbo into the first round in which we show you footage from the week's news and ask you random questions such as Ian and Dilly, uh, what's this blast from the past doing several thousand miles from Bexley? Ah, oh, it's Cat Stevens. <laughs> uh, On his way to have a baby, I think. <laughs> no, it's actually Ted Heath. Yes. Mm. Returning from um, Baghdad and he's smuggling out 29, 30 hostages <laughs> under his shirt. <laughs> Excellent, yes, well, uh, the figures weren't right, it was 40, but uh, you can certainly have two points for that. Looked like 30. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, the trip may, may not have been necessary because Saddam could be pulling out of Kuwait after the Prophet Muhammad appeared to him in his bedroom at 3 o'clock in the morning and told him to retreat. Strange he didn't seem to notice that Muhammad should choose to manifest himself as a fat, white-haired old Englishman wearing a sailor's hat and a light baggy badge. Paul and Simon, now what new scientific breakthrough are we witnessing here? Um, oh, this is the, um, the, the male contraceptive pill to stop men getting pregnant. <laughs> This is the uh, male contraceptive pill which is currently being developed at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. In trials so far it has a 98% success rate, but doctors are hoping that the side effects, which are that it makes you fat and spotty, will take care of the remaining 2%. <laughs> uh, they're now working on a new pill which is guaranteed 100% effective. All they have to do is condense 9.5 pints of lager into a tablet form. <laughs> and they'll have it. Ian and Dilly, uh, who is this marked man? Mandy Wyman after several years of marriage to Bill. <laughs> He's got a nice collection of uh, books. This is Howard Marks, isn't it? It is Howard Marks, yes. drug smuggler. <clears throat> yes, he is a drug smuggler, though he claimed when he was tried the first time that he was an MI6 agent who was infiltrating the IRA by selling them marijuana, <laughs> which for some reason the jury believed. <laughs> um, but an American jury didn't. They've sent him down. Yes, Howard Marks, the international drug smuggler, or at least that's what it says on his passport, uh, just been sent down to... 25 years in an American jail. Curiously, he was shot to the police. Does anyone know by whom? By the fact that he wrote a book called High Times. <laughs> and um, the police had a look at the book and thought, oh, he obviously reads the Times. <laughs> um, yes. And even they worked out that this was a reference to marijuana, as they call it. Mm, in the trade. Yes, uh, he was also shot to the police by Colin Moynihan's half-brother, uh, Lord Moynihan, unusual Christian name. Um, <laughs> finally, in this round, Paul and Simon explain this mess. Uh, Princess Anne making her way home. Uh, <laughs> it's the um, uh, strike of Spanish truck drivers, uh, which completely blocked the border. Uh, they're protesting against the import of um, thousands of cheap British hedgehogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought they were demanding petrol subsidies, but there we are. Uh, yes, well, two points to you, Simon. Well done. Hundreds of sweating Brits have been pressed against each other for a fortnight in unbearable heat with hardly any food and no sanitation. Spaniards were probably just trying to make them feel as if they're on holiday. <laughs> which, uh, which brings us happily to the end of this first round, at which point the score... Well, Paul and Simon have four, and Ian and Dilly an equal four. saying it's sexy. 
Well, That's, yes. That, I think that is right, isn't it? It is right. Can she's responsible. Yes, yeah, she's responsible for the recent win in Eastbourne. Um, <laughs> so I'm saying that she fancied Paddy Ashdown rotten. Um, <laughs> No, that's not true. No, it can't be true. <laughs> I can't believe that. It's actually a 60-second public service video that she's recorded, wearing only an American flag and her underwear. Sounds a bit overdressed for her. <laughs> um, the idea is to encourage, yes, young people to vote with her slogan, Voting is Sexy. I must say, uh, I've always found making my way to a local school hall on a wet Thursday morning and writing across on a piece of paper with a half-chewed pencil, a bit of a turn-on, too. <laughs> than anyone else. Um, Ian, right, what's going on in this? Gaddafi dreams of a green Sahara. Mm -hmm. He's going to gas everybody in the Sahara. <laughs> no, this is one of Gaddafi's dreams again. He has, <laughs> he has very pleasant dreams in which the them? prophet comes to him and says, um, you were quite right to take Q8, why don't you withdraw a bit and keep all the oil fields so you'll be rich. Yes. Um, and uh, he says, what a good idea, prophet. I'll do that. Yeah, the I wrong think you may have the wrong man that's the only thing, insofar as... <laughs> Could I just apologise to Colonel Gaddafi <laughs> for the appalling suggestion that he would gas anyone, <laughs> that he dreams of the prophet, and that he's a barking Arab lunatic. <laughs> Which he isn't. I should have referred to Saddam Hussein. No, I'm afraid don't. I've got no idea what this is about. At all. <laughs> As is horribly apparent. Yes, uh, it's Colonel Gaddafi, I'll tell you, who plans to uh, make the Sahara green by planting 40,000 palm trees. Now, unfortunately, because the Sahara is a desert, he's noticed that, uh, they have to be made of plastic. Rather a cruel joke to play on anyone stranded in the desert, crawling towards an oasis. Looks luscious and mouth-watering from a distance, but when you get up close, it's all plastic. A bit like Brigitte Nielsen, really. And uh, the score, astonishingly now, stands at, uh, well, Paul's team have nine, and... Uh, well, Ian's team are dragging lamentably behind with seven. <laughs> it's time now to get down and get cryptic as we show each team a set of apparently and indeed genuinely unconnected images, which taken together cunningly encapsulate a major news story of the week. Ian and Dilly, explain this if you will. Oh, it's Colonel Gaddafi. <laughs> well spotted. Saddam Hussein. <laughs> yep. That's a jail, isn't it? Yep. That isn't. Sewing mail bags. Post office. And barbecue. Barbecue. And that's a sausage. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, there's Ernest Saunders. <laughs> Good. Well, you've managed to identify what's going on in the film. Now, what's the story? The story is the um, Gerald Ronson story, um, which is that Gerald Ronson, having been sent to jail for fraud, um, has been treated rather well in jail. Uh, Gerald Ronson managed to make a doctor's appointment, so he had two appointments, one before and one after lunch, and he was taken by his chauffeur from the jail to his appointment. Then he was dropped off at home for an agreeable barbecued lunch. Then he went to his other doctor's appointment, because he's suffering from stress. The, uh, <laughs> the stress of being allowed home to have lunch with your wife when you've been inside for about five minutes. <laughs> yes, being out to lunch. And then he went home to jail, which I assume is David Waddington's attempt to solve the problem of overcrowding by letting the fantastically rich people out for the day. For barbecues, yes. Yes, absolutely right. I'll give you two points for that. Yes, he can also, uh, he's also allowed a uh, private doctor. He has a telephone and television. Uh, he can travel to London on his own, and he drives around in a chauffeur-driven Lancia. He's uh, currently considering an appeal to have his sentence extended. <laughs> uh, Paul and Simon, here's your misleading montage. That, that's Sarah Keyes, isn't it? Sessible. Showing the new male contraceptive makes yeah, your head yeah. loose. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a, a cow, I can't believe that's a reference to our Prime Minister. Yeah. Saddam Hussein again. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the... Um, Sarah Keyes has, has complained to her solicitor because... Um, it, Sir John Junior said he had lunch with Cecil Parkinson and Cecil Parkinson claimed that two... Swiss men had approached him um, to take a contract out in Sarah Keys, mm -hmm. and she was a bit worried because Cecil's not known for shooting blanks. 
Yes, it is uh, Cecil Parkinson and Sarah Keys again. Uh, she just won't lie down, will she? <laughs> well, not anymore, anyway. Um, anyway, let's just uh, check on the score again. And uh, Ian and Dilly have eight, and Paul and Simon are forging ahead with eleven. Well, let's now delve ruthlessly into the past for our archive round. As usual, one piece of film per team. They have to tell us what happened next. Ian and Dilly, consider this. Most expert opinion, uh, setting aside those who want to drive divisions between the services, uh, is of the opinion we've probably got the balance about right. But why should the public on this issue, as regards the future of the Royal Navy, believe you, a transient, uh, here today, and if I may say so, gone tomorrow, politician? Now, what happened next? <laughs> oh, well, this is um, the uh, celebrated occasion when John Knott um, was being interviewed. That's him there. He was Defence Secretary, I think. He was being interviewed by Sir Robin Day. Uh, they're here today and gone to BSB tomorrow, <laughs> uh, interviewer. And uh, Robin there was being his usual charming, pleasant self. And John Knott walked out. OK, well, you say he walks out. Let's have a look. But why should the public on this issue as regards the future of the Royal Navy, believe you, a transient, uh, here today, and, if I may say so, gone tomorrow, politician, rather really than a senior officer of many years. I'm, I'm shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Knott. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Knott. Uh, Paul and Simon, a similar feeling of deja vu for you. The Six O'Clock News from the BBC with Sue Lawley and Nicholas Winchell. Now, what happened then? They start playing table tennis. <laughs> It's too simple, I'm afraid, mate. Um, this is, um, I think I know what this is. I never, I never saw it at the time. This must be when there was a, a group of people sort of broke into the studio. It's about clause 28, was it, I think? Sounding good so far. Let's just see how right you are. The Six O'Clock News from the BBC with Sue Lawley and Nicholas Winchell. <laughs> Good evening, the headlines at six o'clock. In the House of Lords, a vote is taking place now on a challenge to the poll tax. Tory rebels have said that the tax is unfair and unpopular. Another prosecution involving undercover police and alleged football hooligans has collapsed. No evidence was offered. And repairing the roads. Why the codes codes signal a lot more chaos this summer. And I do apologise if you're hearing quite a lot of noise in this studio at the moment. I'm afraid that um, we have rather been invaded by some people who we hope to be removing very shortly. Any time we can possibly ignore the background news, we'll bring the news as best we can. Absolutely desperate to host the Wogan show. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually an invasion of lesbians. It was, driven wild by Sue Lawley's legs. <laughs> Yes. Well, Nick is. Witchell was actually sitting on a lesbian next door. Which must have been fun for, um, for Nick Witchell. <laughs> yes, you're right, actually. Nicholas Witchell went on to uh, read the news while a manacled lesbian struggled beneath him, desperately trying to avoid the main points again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, at the end of that round, the score, well, uh, Paul and Simon have a still sumptuous 13, and Ian and Dilly have rather less appetising 11. And so we chug wearily on to our odd one out round. Four famous faces each. One doesn't fit, but which one? Paul, four much loved entertainers for you. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, Bob Hawke, Ken Dodd, and La Gaza Ladra, <laughs> according to Justice Harmon. Uh, they've all cried in public, apart from Ken Dodd. Did he, he not did. cry during his trial? No. He had the whole no, he laughed, symphony actually. orchestra playing violins in the dock. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Bob Hawke's cried, isn't he? He cried mm -hmm. when um, something happened to him. And Paul Gascoigne cried when something happened to him. And yes. Margaret Thatcher cried when um, something happened to, to, uh, to her. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> That's the way I read it at the time, anyway. Yes, yes, she cried when her a... son got lost in the desert. Everyone else was cried. laughing. <laughs> and everybody cried when they found him. <laughs> Yes, absolutely right. Uh, all of them have shed tears on television, except Ken Dodd, who of course sang tears on television, as music lovers may well remember. So, uh, we come on to Simon, and uh, a famous foursome for you, David Steele, Terry Wogan, Jeffrey Howe, David Bellamy. They're all crap. <laughs> so, you have to choose one that isn't. It's that, that Irish fellow at the top right, he's the only one you never see on the Wogan show. <laughs> Um, they've all made records except. Ooh, yes. They've all made records except. Yes. Um, Jeffrey Howe. Yeah. Yes. yes. They've all and made David, records. David Steele made a record uh, which was It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jeffrey Howe never made a record, but if he had, it would have been No Woman, No Cry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the answer is Jeffrey Howe is the only one not to have recorded a novelty single, at least as far as we know. Uh, Terry Wogan recorded The Floral Dance, sadly. Uh, David Bellamy recorded O Brontosaurus, Will You Wait For Me? <laughs> <laughs> While David Steele, would you believe, recorded a rap called I Feel Liberal All Right. You can help me to change the face of British politics. Let's pull our country together instead of tearing it apart. That's what the Liberal Alliance is all about. Join us and help to build a better place to live. Mmm. <laughs> and you Maybe. wonder why they lost. <laughs> <laughs> Philly is your four. Prince Philip, Sir Alistair Burnett, Princess Margaret and Michael Fagan. Oh, well. I, I assume that uh, one of them hasn't been into the Queen's bedroom. Now, which? Prince Philip. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's knew, very unfair. <laughs> I knew it was somebody with a title. Um, it, I think it has to be uh, Sir Alistair. Yes, uh, it is Sir Alistair Burnett, yes, who's the only one not to have shared the Queen's bed. Doubtless much to his chagrin. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, in this <laughs> apology, <laughs> since when has mm. Princess Margaret and the Queen gone to bed together? Yeah. <laughs> well, we I missed this story. That, I'm sure it uh, made the news. At some stage during her childhood, Princess Margaret will probably have shared a bed. Well, you assume queen. a great deal, is all I can say. <laughs> well, uh, well, well, we'll just check it out. I'm sure the, I'm sure the producer can swapping ring makeup up. tips, I should think. <laughs> yes, and uh, Michael Fagan, of course, sat on the end of her bed. That's sufficient. And Prince Philip, well, presumably shared her bed sometime early on in the marriage. They always are in separate rooms and they have sex, actually. Ah. Yeah. So they use a sort of royal hose pipe, which can... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> The neck where it takes it down the corridor, it's I think. It's about as true as Angus's lesbian rumour about the Queen and her sister. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Honest guy. I think I, I get into trouble thing. for stuff. God. <laughs> Finally in this round, Ian, a dubious selection for you. Uh, Rupert Murdoch. Oh, yes. Alvin Stardust. Your friend. And John Selwyn Gummer. Well, they're all quite thin, except the one on the left, who's really fat. <laughs> <laughs> That's Insulting. just sort of verbal abuse, really, isn't it? It is. They all run newspapers, except the one on the left, the fat one. <laughs> You're sounding almost biased now, isn't it? <laughs> they're all born-again Christians, except Maxwell. Rupert Murdoch, the owner of The Sun, is a born-again Christian. <laughs> That's about as believable as most of what you read in The Sun. <laughs> No, it's true, apparently. Roop, the porn-again Christian. Um, <laughs> Alvin Stardust is born again. Uh, as what? I don't know. Mm -hmm. John Selwyn Gummer is a member of the General Synod. And yes, is a, is a severe born again. Um, Christian. Which and you? Robert Maxwell is the big fat guy on the left. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, virtually everything is right. Uh, Robert Maxwell is the old one out because... Uh, the others are into God, whereas, of course, Robert, Robert Maxwell is God, as we know. <laughs> and that uh, godless remark brings us to the end of this round. And, uh, well, Paul and Simon have 17, and Ian and Dilly are fighting a rearguard action with 16.
So, as if by magic, we seem to have reached the last round, which is, of course, our missing words round. Each team gets a set of headlines and has to call out the missing word or find a better alternative. As usual, we lead off with the team currently languishing in second place in a vain attempt to give the game some sort of competitive edge at this late stage. So, uh, Ian and Dilly, to your starting blocks, please. What found in supermarket salmon? Lord Lucan. <laughs> Is not correct. Salmon. That'd be a bit of a shock, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, that's not right either. Um, poison a curry. Botulism. Yes, absolutely. Poison. Nerve poison is the actual uh, is the actual answer. Put there by Gaddafi <laughs> or Hussein or one of those people. <laughs> Who says satire is dead? It's not very well. That's all. <laughs> Next, live daytime TV. More boring than a dead what? Jeffrey Howe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Parrot? Um, uh, no, you think so. Not as such. No, salmon is the answer. Oh, salmon. salmon. Uh, next, Ken and Maggie's wobbly what? Um, Joel's? Oh, friendship. I... And I'll Ken and Maggie's it's... wobbly hairstyles. No, it's not salmon either. Um, Ted Heath. I'm going to have to tell you it's weekend is the answer. And is this another one of your appalling rumours? <laughs> Uh, some of my best friends were what, says Fergie. Thin. Human. <laughs> well, 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 drug addicts? Drug addicts. Uh, I'll take that. Junkies is the actual answer. Good. So, uh, Paul and Simon, your turn, starting with a robbery story. Gunman wore what? Boxing gloves. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. Um, no, but seriously. But no, but seriously. Uh, cling film. Cling film is the right answer. Well done. Next. Major splashes out billions to buy what? Breast implants. <laughs> Votes, I think, is the term. Votes is the this right answer. This is a child answer. benefit. Yes, yeah, so Ian leapt in there. Uh, next, dinosaur found in what? Supermarket salmon. <laughs> Lord Denning's underpants. <laughs> You're guessing here. No. Um, Wiltshire. Um, I'll give you one Museum. point there. Museum. Teabag. No, it's the Cotswold, so you're... you're <laughs> right. The day Sedan finally tuned into what? Songs of Praise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not far off. Colonel Gaddafi's Dreams. <laughs> uh, I think it's Derek Jameson. Uh, Sky Television. No, no one tunes into Sky Television. No. <laughs> Blue Peter was the actual answer. Uh, and after all that, let's check on the uh, final tally, and I can tell you that... Uh, this week's sad acts are Paul and Simon with 20, and this week's joyful winners are Ian and Dilly with 22. How did we lose? So, congratulations to our winners and derision and public scorn to our losers, unless, of course, they can redeem themselves in this uh, final, final round, the caption competition. Paul and Simon, what did you come up with for this? Fergie, I preferred it when you used Imac. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Ian and Dilly? Uh, I thought maybe that's no way to treat the Princess Royal. <laughs> I think it's a member of the public saying, Good evening, officer, do you have the time? <laughs> <laughs> you will that'll do nicely. So uh, with that, we say thank you to our guests, Ian Hislop and Dilly Keane, and Paul Merton and Simon Hoggett. Let me leave you with news that Cher has been forced to abandon her British tour after her costumes were attacked by giant moths. <laughs> and Mrs Thatcher, in place of the traditional gold watch, unveils her own personal leaving present to Nigel Lawson. <laughs> Good night. Ben Livingston, again, takes up the challenge in tomorrow night's show at the same time, 11. In a moment, a 16-year-old case is closed in Forensic Files.